The recent French presidential elections, the first round of which recently took place, is yet another striking example of the kind of sudden and sharp changes which are implicit in the present situation internationally. Uh, we've got so used now to the idea of political earthquakes, which used to be exceptional in the past, now they appear to be the norm. Political earthquake in Scotland, political earthquake in the British Labour Party, political earthquake with Podemos in Spain, political earthquake above all with the election of Trump in the States. And yes, now we have the latest political earthquake, which has caused tremors throughout Europe on a, on a, on a global scale, is this first interesting round in the French elections. Yes, this was quite an extraordinary state of affairs, an extraordinary turn around. If one bears in mind that only a few months ago, only about three months ago, François Fillon, the main uh, representative of the main bourgeois party uh, in France, was considered to be absolutely invincible. He was going to win the elections uh, come what may. It was almost like a coronation with François Fillon just waiting for the crown to be placed upon his head. At that time, uh, not so long ago, for th three, three or four months ago, uh, Fillon had 50%. Astonishing uh, majority, a figure that apparently guaranteed him victory. Yes, and yet, and yet, and yet, when push came to shove, François Fillon suffered a humiliating defeat. From 50% he got uh, about 19%. Of those. Behind Jean-Luc uh, Jean Mélenchon, the candidate of the left, who got almost 20%. So here, a, a shattering defeat of the main bourgeois candidate is quite astonishing. Even more astonishing is the fact, and this bears uh, emphasizing, that here, for the first time since 1958, in the second round, which will take place uh, shortly, in the second round of the French presidential election, there will be no candidate from either of the two main, uh, main parties in France. And here, the, the defeat of Fillon was a, was a humiliation. Yes, but that's nothing compared to the crushing defeat, a real humiliation, a crushing defeat of the French Socialist Party, which after all... Uh, was one of the main parties in France, which won, by the way, let's not forget, a crushing victory a few years ago when, with the election of François Hollande. And yet the French Socialist Party achieved the grand total of 6.4%. I mean, that's the kind of percentage you'd expect from some extra-parliamentary sect. But no, no, this is, the, this is the great French Socialist Party, suffering a, crush, a crushing defeat, and I hasten to, to add, a well-deserved defeat. Yes, Hollande and the French Socialist Party got the, the, the defeat which they richly deserved for their betrayal and for carrying out uh, the, this vicious policy of, of austerity and cuts. Which they did, despite the fact that Hollande stood on the program originally, a program of opposition to austerity. So they, they suffered a, a defeat. Incidentally, this is, this is not just a, a single uh, isolated uh, defeat. It seems to represent a broader trend. The Financial Times even today commented on that in an interesting article about the European social democracy. Uh, you see, you've had the defeat of the Dutch Labour Party quite recently. Uh, previous to that, you had the shattering defeat of the Irish Labour Party, who got what they deserved for participating in a coalition, uh, again, with bourgeois parties carrying out uh, deep cuts. In Spain, the PSOE, the main socialist party, party of the left, in inverted commas, uh, which was in power not long ago in uh, in Spain, is now struggling to maintain its position as the main opposition party, as opposed to Podemos, which is a recent uh, party, apparently coming from nowhere, which is uh, on the point at least of overtaking it, if it hasn't overtaken it uh, already. So this is, this, this is, yes, this is once again a political earthquake, which represents what? 
Well, that's an interesting question. Because we have here the same, I would argue, the same tendency. I've made this point before on previous occasions. But it's a fact. It's the same tendency that exists everywhere, even in the United States, also in Britain, with the Brexit vote and so on. It's a, a profound discontent, more than discontent. It's a feeling of absolute rage, of indignation, above all, of frustration at all the existing uh, parties of what is considered to be correctly the establishment. It's a rebellion, it's a revolt, it's an insurrection, it's a rebellion, it's a revolution, in effect, against this establishment. This gang of wealthy people and their hangers-on in the political uh, parties and so on, which really control the wealth and, and the destinies of, uh, of the nation. So it's an attempt. <clears throat> All right, it's, it, it, it is an unconscious or semi-conscious attempt on the part of the mass of the people to reject this status quo and seek a change. That's what's at, at the bottom of this. All right, it's not clear, it's not uh, conscious, and yet there is this striving, this desperate striving for a change. People are fed up with the status quo. They don't want to know the status quo. They're fed up with the existing parties, which have failed, signally failed. Also the parties of the left, the so-called left, have signally failed. And therefore there is this desperate search for uh, an alternative, for a change, which is reflected on the electoral plane, and we'll see more of this in the future, in violent swings to the left, but also to the right. We must be prepared for this. Now, of course, the victor in this first round, probably also in the second round, but we will see, is uh, this man, Emmanuel Macron. Now, who is Mr. Macron? That's a good question. Emmanuel Macron. He comes, uh, comes across as Mr. Nice Guy. Very nice designer suits, sharp suits, a very nice fixed po political politician smile on his face, shaking hands with everybody, kissing babies and so on. Nice kind of chap who poses as a progressive. Mr. Nice Guy, the centre, the party of the centre. Oh yes, they're full of it, aren't they now? On Channel 4 News and everywhere else, they're full of it. Oh, the, the centre strikes back. It's like the, the Star Wars uh, film, you know. The Empire strikes back. All these nasty populists of the left and of the right. And finally, and here they've got their comeuppance. The centre is back in town. Well, we'll see how long this centre lasts once Mr. Macron finds himself in the Elysee Palace. We will see how long he lasts. Not very long. The FFP, the FT today made the same prediction. He wasn't going to last very long, and that's perfectly correct. The centre actually is breaking down every bit, because the centre, in effect, although it seems to represent everything and everyone, you know, it actually represents a gigantic zero. That's what it represents. And this zero is going to break down under the hammer blow of events. But go back to Mr. Macron. Where does Monsieur Macron come from? Monsieur Macron, who pretends to be stand for everyone and an every man and the, the, the representative of the whole people and of unity and so on. This Macron, who poses as a progressive, well, there's nothing progressive about him. He's an ex, a former Rothschild banker. That's who he is. Moreover, this new politician representing new politics is not new at all. Uh, Emmanuel Macron was actually the economics minister, wait for it, the economic minister in this outgoing, unpopular, hated government of, uh, of Hollande. And therefore, it's clear what this man stands for. Actually, if you look at the substance of his policies, as opposed to the, the spin, which of course is considerable and amplified a thousandfold in all the media, of course. They all, all support the Macron, that's why he succeeded. He had the, had the wholesale backing of the establishment of big business and of the mass media. That's the people that he stands for, of course. Uh, but you see, if you look at his programme as opposed to the spin, it's the same as Fillon's programme. Oh yes. In the, in the last analysis, it will be a program of cuts and austerity. In other words, more of the same. I repeat, this man was the economics minister of the outgoing government. And therefore, you think for one moment 
but he'll have a different policy in the ingoing government if he's in charge of it, which he probably will be. I answer emphatically, no, he will not. Of course, Macron's victory was, was uh, welcomed in the, a unanimous chorus. That should make you suspicious for a start. Uh, this, this chorus of approval, more than approval, euphoria. On the stock exchanges, the stock exchanges rose not just in France, but in Britain, in America, everywhere, on the, on the victory of this marvellous Monsieur uh, Macron. Uh, the European polit politicians fell over themselves, one, one from, from Berlin, from every, every, every chancellery, from Britain naturally. The Conservatives welcomed this victory as a great victory for common sense and Europe, a great victory for Europe, because he's a pro-European, pro-EU. You know, this, this man is the man of the establishment, be sure of it, there's no question about this. He's a boss's man and his policy will, will be uh, just as bad and just as reactionary as uh, was Francois Hollande, who he served. There's a, a little bit of a, a rule of thumb here, if you like, a little bit of uh, homespun science. As a general rule of thumb, my friends, where the stock exchange rises, what, what, what pleases the stock exchange is definitely not in the interest of the ordinary working people. You can take that as read. And therefore, what's the perspective now for the uh, second round? Well, of course, uh, it'll be a contest between <coughs> Macron, and uh, another bourgeois candidate, a right-wing candidate, Marine Le Pen, whose main base, whose main support, and she has support, it's uh, clear, is in the north-east of France, the run-down industries, the rust belt, uh, areas of high unemployment, similar to the north-east of England, as a matter of fact, who voted Brexit. And it's a similar kind of thing, that's why people, uh, their support uh, Le Pen, because they feel correctly betrayed and let down by the existing politicians of left and right, and therefore Le Pen apparently offers them a solution <clears throat> in the form of uh, more jobs for French workers on the basis of patriotism against the EU, uh, take France out of the Euro, things of this nature, very similar to the Brexit uh, line of the Tory right wing, uh, which now rules I in Britain. Le Pen, of course, she also has a base the other places, the southeast of France, that's on the Mediterranean coast, the area around Marseille, although she lost in Marseille. In Mar Marseille was won by the left-wing candidate Mélenchon, quite interesting. I'll give the figures later on. I didn't expect that. I assumed that Marseille, I assumed wrongly that Marseille was going to vote for Le Pen. It did not. That's interesting because if you analyse the elect electoral vote, what you find is that in very many areas where Le Pen won, where Marine Le Pen won, Mélenchon, Jean-Luc uh, Jean Mélenchon, the, the, what is known as the extreme left-wing candidate, that's how he's portrayed, portrayed as the French Chavez and the French uh, Fidel Castro, and I don't know what. But Mélenchon came very, very close to winning in, in Le Pen's constituency, where she won. So that's uh, an interesting point, which shows the same point I'm making, that what people are looking for here is a change. And whether it comes from Le Pen, of course, doesn't really represent a change at all, or from uh, Mélenchon, who does represent uh, a, a more left-wing left program, you can say, quite a radical program in, in, in many ways. That uh, People want to change either way, same as in the States, by the way, where many people who voted for, for Trump would have voted for Bernie Sanders, if Sanders would have been uh, available, uh, if he had stood, which he was not. But anyway, to go back to this uh, Le Pen, uh, Le Pen uh, was in second place, and therefore the choice in the second round will be between Le, Le Pen and uh, Macron. She's quite a smart customer, by the way, <laughs> in the same way that Trump, in a way, was quite smart. In the same way as Trump, she appealed demagogically to the workers, oh yes, appealed to the working class and to the unemployed, and to, allegedly against the establishment and so on, against the rich, which of course ultimately she is not. She's a typical conservative, reactionary, nationalist uh, politician. Uh, and therefore doesn't represent the interest, interests of the workers, but nevertheless he posed as such. 
posed as, as a candidate that was against the establishment. And therefore this gave her a certain credibility. Yes, but more interesting than, uh, than, uh, than that was the phenomenon of the, the extraordinary rise of, of what, who the person that was described as the extreme left-wing candidate, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, who seemed to come from nowhere. Of course, he, he has a certain history, he stood in the past, but nevertheless, his original uh, poll rating was only 10%. This, this is about a couple of months ago, 10%. In the event, he almost beat Le Pen, and could have beaten Le Pen, have it not, had it not been, among other things, for the stupidity of the so-called French uh, ultra-lefts, uh, sectarians, so-called Trotskyists, nothing to do with Trotsky or anything else, a bunch of complete uh, idiots. Three of these uh, uh, groups stood, put up candidates. Now, if you add up the, the, the votes, which they stood no chance of winning, of course, but they always put up candidates anyway, like a ritual, like a religious ritual. That's all it is, by the way. The same as the, the same gang in Britain. I wouldn't even, wouldn't even mention them. You know what I'm talking about. They put up uh, three. If you add up the votes of those th th those three candidates of the left that stood, they would have, that those votes alone would have given Mélenchon a higher vote than Le Pen. That being the case, my friend, the second uh, round in France would not have been between Macron and Le Pen, but between Le Pen and Mélenchon, between the right and the left, which of course would have been a highly desirable outcome from the standpoint of the French working class. And if that was not the case, I'll call a spade a shovel. I don't care if I give offence to anybody, I'm telling the truth. It's partly because of the stupidity and the irresponsibility of the ultra-left sects in France, just as stupid and irresponsible as they are in all other countries. I'll leave that to one side. I've got no desire to pursue this particular uh, argument. Now, Mélenchon came, as I say, almost from nowhere and got uh, uh, almost defeated Le Pen. Almost got 20%, an extraordinary result. And although he didn't succeed, although he was uh, knocked out, narrowly knocked out, I, I, might, I might add. Nevertheless, his campaign was a colossal success, coming almost from nowhere. And yet, and yet, comrades from France were reporting to me, from Paris, from Toulouse, from many other areas, in every cafe, in every restaurant, in every marketplace, in every bus stop, people were talking about Mélenchon, Jean-Luc uh, Jean Mélenchon. His mal uh, he had ma massive rallies all over France, so huge, by the way, was the with these rallies, which he addressed in very left-wing uh, language, very radical uh, language, against the rich, that the, the, the rich people who run France must, must temp, will tremble and so on and so forth. He, he made a very, very uh, radical-sounding speeches. But these were, these rallies were so big that the people wouldn't couldn't fit into them. He had to he had to have what do they call it a hologram, isn't it called? Thousands of people actually turned up just to see a hologram of, of, of this man speaking. And his result really was quite uh, remarkable. I have a list here. I'll read it from because my memory is not very good. Uh, Le Havre, 29%. Th these are areas where he won. Mélenchon actually won. He had the majority in places like Le Havre, which is in the northeast. I think that's the kind of area that Le Pen could have expected to win. In Toulouse, 29%. In Marseille where I would have expected again the National Front candidate to win. Uh, it was Mélenchon that won in Marseille, oh yes, with 24.88%. Uh, and in Paris, in Paris also, by the way, in every area, Mélenchon won or had a very high vote in the working class areas. This was a class vote. There's no, two, no arguments about this. For example, in, pa in Paris, uh, Paris Saint-Denis, strong working class, uh, part of the red belt of Paris, he got 34%, an extraordinary figure. In the 20th district in Paris, 31.8%. He also came, came first in places like Lille, uh, Montpellier, and other areas, also the overseas, uh, overseas territories, such as Guyana, which just had a general strike. He won in Guyana. More important uh, still was the fact that the, the youth of France, the young people, Particularly the young North Africans and the Ar Arabs and so on uh, the, were, were very enthused by Mélenchon's campaign. He got 30 percent 
of uh, youngsters, of young French voters, between 18 and 24 years of age, he scored 30%, a, a considerable victory. And therefore the Mélenchon campaign, that's the most important and interesting thing from the standpoint of Marxists, from our point of view. And it shows a colossal constituency, a potential constituency, and a real constituency there for a genuine left uh, candidate. As I say, if he didn't get to, to, to the second stage, well, our, our friends on the ultra-left have got quite a lot to answer for, and they should be brought to book for this, this stupidity. Now, just one word about the second round. It, uh, it was predictable, wasn't it? Wasn't it just predictable? That when Marine Le Pen emerged as the victor, at least as being presented as a candidate in the second round, immediately the tom-toms began to beat, didn't they? The war drums began to beat. And people started to jump up and down like a jack-in-the-box, you know. Fascism, fascism, yes. Let me just spell this out so, so even a little child can understand what I'm about to say. My friends, I regret to inform you that Marine Le Pen, whatever you say about her, but this woman, she's not actually a fascist. Marine Le Pen is a common or garden, conservative, right-wing, bourgeois politician. No different in, in essence to Trump in the States, or some people describe him also as a fascist, which is also wrong. And uh, the, the British Brexit crowd, she's no different to the Brexiteers in the Labour Party if it comes uh, to that. Marine Le Pen was smart, is a career politician. She's smart enough to realize that there's no votes in fascism or racism or anti-Semitism, which is why she actually expelled her father, who, if he wasn't actually a fascist, was a very good imitation of one. But there we are. That's uh, another matter, a family matter. Now she's even taken the step of, of temporarily, at least, resigning from the leadership of the National Front. She's after the middle ground. She wants to be a respectable, ordinary, bourgeois, right-wing politician. That's all she is. And yet you've got these circus clowns. Yes, that's what you are. A bunch of ridiculous circus clowns being hysterical about the question of fascism. Now, what's, what's damaging about uh, that stupid nonsense is this. The same in the States with Trump. Oh, Trump, fascist, fascist, fascist. That leads straight to the following argument. You know what it is. The argument of the lesser evil. Let's all unite against fascism. Let's all unite in favor of democracy, my friends. Oh, yes, they've started already. The French Socialist Party, to their shame, the Socialist Party, the Communist Party, if you can credit that, my friends, the so-called Communist Party of France, the Greens were supposed all support, guess who? Monsieur Macron. This wretched, vile, bourgeois, reactionary gangster. Oh yes, he's the lesser evil. You must support Macron. That's what they say. Astonishing. At least, to his credit, uh, Mélenchon has not done this. Uh, at least he's, he hasn't so far, so far at least, hasn't buckled to this uh, tremendous pressure for the lesser evil against fascism. And he's keeping his options open. He sent out a circle that I think, putting three options to his supporters, which is uh, uh, spoilt vote, uh, abstention, or vote for, for Macron. He's leaving it in the hands of his uh, followers. That's better than nothing, I suppose. Certainly he hasn't yet come, he hasn't yet come out to support Macron. That's to his credit. It's an absolute scandal, an absolute abomination, and an absolute betrayal that anyone pretending to be a left-wing or a socialist or a communist should ask for support for this gangster Macron under any circumstances. No, no, no. Comrades in France, your duty in the second round is, is not to vote for anyone, to abstain. An active boycott, I would say. We've got the May Day coming up. Let's uh, 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 agitate in favor of mass demonstrations against all these bourgeois politicians and reactionaries. The trade unions come, come off, get, get off, get off your, your, your asses and, and put forward the idea of a 24 general's protest strike against unemployment and the, and the poverty that afflicts and the racism that, uh, that afflicts. France at the present time. There's no question of supporting any bourgeois candidate in this election or any other, I would say. And anyone that does that is performing a shameful role, which they will live to regret. Which they will undoubtedly, they'll be rubbing their ass in the future. Excuse my French.
You see, the, uh, the FT already made that point in today's article. They, they both, the clever bourgeois, where they come to the same conclusion as the Marxists, uh, usually, quite often, from their class point of view, and they point out the, what the evident facts. Macron is, 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 has, has won the election, yes, but what will he do? I've got the quote somewhere, I haven't got time to read it just now. Take my word for it. Macron will, no, will, will, will be no, uh, 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 no more able to solve the problems of the French people than uh, Hollande or Sarkozy or any of the other gangsters in the past. And I will predict now that a Macron government will be a government of crisis and probably won't last very long. And very soon, very soon, those same people, even some of the, many of those that vote for Macron, will be on the streets of France. We know France. We know the French people, we know the French working class, with their revolutionary traditions, traditions of the French Revolution, traditions of the French Commune, the Paris Commune, traditions of 1934-36 and so on, traditions of 1968, when I was present in France at the time, a magnificent movement. That's the real France, not this nonsense about vote for the lesser evil and, and Macron. It's the France of the streets, the France of the factories, the France of the working class, the France of the peasants, the France of, France of the unemployed, the France of the immigrants. And together, this is the force, the only force that can overthrow Macron and the other bourgeois uh, reactionaries and fight for a genuine change in France. That's to say, to fight for a real French workers' government with a socialist program pledged to the overthrow of capitalism and a socialist France in a socialist Europe.